Hi students, Professor Laney here with Chapter 2, Conception, Heredity, and Environment. So again, we are in our Foundation Unit, Unit 1, where we learn everything of what it takes to make a baby and what could be going down in there, right? So let's let's hop on in. Okay, again, when we started, we start, started talking about... Um, like just the introduction, everything that we're going to be learning about, but now we're moving all the way to, you guessed it, fertility and then the whole bit. Now, I'm going to start off this chapter by letting you know, ironically, um, I'm the professor who has gone through a lot of this stuff personally. So I don't mind sharing with you guys, and I want to make sure that you learn, but please be respectful if I share with you that you don't get weird about it, okay? And if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out. Um, it's a lot of times when we're going to be talking about some maybe a, like a rare genetic thing or infertility or um, recessive genes or things like that, defective genes, mutations, yeah, I kind of got some weird stuff going on in my family. So I do want to share with you because I do want people to understand um, the different things that people can go through just trying to have a family. So um, let's hop into it. Good. Make sure you have your book going. And you know what? Um, let's just click over here for a second. Again, get your terms and definitions next to you. Maybe print those out or the fill-in ones. And as we're talking, you'll be able to fill those in. Okay. Make sure that you have all the tools that you can do and have and use. Use them. Okay. I don't make them just for fun. I make them for you. Okay. But it is fun. Anyways, so <laughs> let's go back here. Okay. So again, in looking at um, what we have here in a conception, heredity, and environment, excuse me, we're going to be talking these five areas here, conception and infertility, mechanisms of heredity, what we inherit from our genes, genetic and chromosomal abnormalities or mutations, and then studying the influence of the environment on just a person making babies, uh, characteristics influ influenced by heredity and environment. So our genes and the environment do play together. It's not just nature or nurture. It's technically nature and nurture, but we'll talk about more of that in the future. So again, this first section, we talk about um, conception and, and infertility. And infertility is on the rise, so I'm glad that this book does include it. So let's double check. Where are we starting with? Page 29, to make sure that we are all, all literally on the same page. <clears throat> so fertilization. Okay, so the boy gamete meets girl gamete. And yes, both of our... Um, things that make a baby are called gametes, and it's just the female and the male, right? So in men, there's several hundred million sperm produced each day, a lot. But with women, we have about two million eggs in our ovaries at the time of our birth. So think about that for a second. If you are pregnant right now, if you're female and you're pregnant, I don't know, maybe we do have male pregnant males. I don't know. Science is changing rapidly. And you birth a daughter today, she has in her literally the seeds of your grandchildren. Isn't that crazy? And we'll talk more about epigenetics, about what you eat and how your body is right now it does affect your grandchildren. It's crazy, but cool. Uh, and now ovulation, when we actually have an egg that's produced that can be fertilized, happens about every 28 days until menopause. Now, um, girls can have their first period at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It kind of depends on the female. And then menopause can be as early as in their 30s or late as their 50s. So, again, we don't know how many, like, actual eggs are produced. And some women don't ovulate every month, right? So, again, there's a lot of things that go into actually having a baby successfully. Um, now, Fertilization or conception is really just the process of which the sperm and the ovum combine to create a single-celled organism called a zygote. So this right here is technically, even though there's kind of three cells in there, we would call that a zygote. And as it gets bigger, there's different terms, but we don't need to go into that. Okay. Again, I have videos on this, but I just wanted to show you that as everything works out together, I do have a video to illustrate this and this. It is called a zygote. Make sure you know this as a definition. If it's a definition in the book, you will need to know it. Make sure we get this going here. Ooh, sometimes this gives me a hard time. Oy. This video does not allow embedding. Let's see if I can find it, because I put it in the course modules here. Um, is it this one? I don't know if it's this one. So, uh, yeah, I put it as a backup in the modules, just in case. People want to get crazy. Hi, my about name is Monica, and I'm a Lyft driver. I love Express Let's Pay because I'm able to cash out instantly. Is this the one? Yeah. Now, I 
apologize, there's a huge label right across this because it is for sample use only. You know, people aren't supposed to be making Fertilization money on it. is the epic story but of a single sperm facing we'll incredible it. odds to unite with an egg and form a new human life. It is the story of all of us. During sexual I'm intercourse, about 300 million sperm enter the vagina. Soon afterward, millions of them will either flow out of the vagina or die in its acidic environment. However, many survive because of the protective elements provided in the fluid surrounding them. Next, the sperm must pass through the cervix, an opening into the uterus. Usually, it remains tightly closed, but here the cervix is open for a few days while the woman ovulates. The sperm swim through the cervical mucus, which is thinned to a more watery consistency for easier passage. Once inside the cervix, the sperm continues swimming toward the uterus, though millions will die trying to make it through the mucus. Some sperm remain behind, caught in the folds of the cervix, but they may later continue the journey as a backup to the first group. Inside the uterus, muscular uterine contractions assist the sperm on their journey toward the egg. However, resident cells from the woman's immune system, mistaking the sperm for foreign invaders, destroy thousands more. Next, Half the sperm head for the empty fallopian tube, while the other half swim toward the tube containing the unfertilized egg. Now, only a few thousand remain. Inside the fallopian tube, tiny cilia push the egg toward the uterus. To continue, the sperm must surge against this motion to reach the egg. Some sperm get trapped in the cilia and die. During this part of the journey, chemicals in the reproductive tract cause the membranes covering the heads of the sperm to change. As a result, the sperm become hyperactive, swimming harder and faster toward their destination. At long last, the sperm reach the egg. Only a few dozen of the original 300 million sperm remain. The egg is covered with a layer of cells called the corona radiata. The sperm must push through this layer to reach the outer layer of the egg, the zona pellucida. When sperm reach the zona pellucida, they attach to specialized sperm receptors on the surface, which triggers their acrosomes to release digestive enzymes, enabling the sperm to burrow into the layer. Inside the zona pellucida is a narrow, fluid-filled space just outside the egg cell membrane. The first sperm to make contact will fertilize the egg. After a perilous journey and against incredible odds, a single sperm attaches to the egg cell membrane. Within a few minutes, their outer membranes fuse and the egg pulls the sperm inside. This event causes changes in the egg membrane that prevent other sperm from attaching to it. They're like locked down. Next, the egg releases chemicals that push other sperm away from the egg and create an impenetrable fertilization membrane. As the reaction spreads outward, the zona pellucida hardens, trapping any sperm unlucky enough to be caught inside. Outside the egg, sperm are no longer able to attach to the zona pellucida. Meanwhile, inside the egg, the tightly packed male genetic material spreads out. A new membrane forms around the genetic material, creating the male pronucleus. Inside, the, the genetic material video. reforms into 23 chromosomes. The female genetic material, awakened by the fusion of the sperm with the egg, finishes dividing, resulting in the female pronucleus, which also contains 23 chromosomes. As the male and female pronuclei form, spiderweb-like threads, called microtubules, pull them toward each other. The two sets of chromosomes join together, completing the process of fertilization. 
At this moment, a unique genetic code arises, instantly determining gender, hair color, eye color, and hundreds of other characteristics. Right then. This new single cell, the zygote, is the beginning of a new human being. Mm, learned about that. And now the cilia in the fallopian tube gently sweep the zygote toward the uterus, where he or she will implant in the rich uterine lining, growing and maturing for the next nine months until ready for birth. Fantastic. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that that was one option for us. Okay. Uh, okay, let's get out of here. And number two, let's see if our next one is able to work. <clears throat> this one is how things can go maybe not perfectly well. It's a repeat in some ways, but again, it's not always nice to see it twice. And if it doesn't work in here, we are going to go back to Prezi. I mean, let's go back to our our module here, and so that one, this one's called Infertility Explained. Okay, that's chapter one. We don't need that. Chapter two, right here. And um, I think it's Conception Explained. Good. The journey of life so starts nice with a fascinating race, starting with millions of sperm. Only one, the fastest and the strongest, will reach the finish line. Some fall out of the race, getting lost in the rush through the narrow fallopian tubes, while some are stopped by natural obstacles which protect the woman's body from intruders. Those who make it closer to the end compete fiercely with each other. Together, they attack the egg cell. Their only goal is to be the first one to enter the egg. Only one will make it through, but the others simplify this mission by slowly dissolving the membrane of the egg. Finally, we have a winner. The winning sperm enters the egg and conception occurs. Half the man's and half the woman's chromosomes combine. This creates a unique DNA code which is needed to create new life. These combined chromosomes form the first cell of the new baby. This is now called the zygote. The zygote starts to divide into a cluster of cells and begins to travel to the friendly and safe habitat of the uterus. When the zygote is divided into a bubble of cells, a blastocyst is formed with an inner layer of cells making up the embryo and an outer layer which will protect and nourish the embryo. The blastocyst then finds a comfortable place to stay in the uterus for the next 40 weeks to develop yeah, 40 and weeks, transform into a human being. It's 10 months. Right? Uh, I think they forget to tell people. Uh, it's not nine months. It's ten. Right? And you can you can birth a child at 36 weeks. That's not a problem. There's also a lot of different... Um, we'll talk about when a, a child is born early. We have lots, lots of, like, options. And we'll talk about that as we go. Um, okay, so next. Okay, good. Okay, so there's many, many causes of infertility. So in men, it could be a physical thing like low sperm count, or they just have poor nutrition, or they've been exposed to um, different things at their workplace, sometimes gases and heavy metals and things like that. Sometimes sperm don't swim. Sometimes there's just a genetic issue with the family. Um, and for women, again, I mentioned sometimes you have the eggs, but they don't come out. They're not ready. Um, sometimes you have eggs, but they're like small and they're not really good um, sometimes there's mucus too much mucus in the in the cervix sometimes the immune system is too strong and it fights off everybody um, sometimes there's diseases or there's missing parts or the tubes are blocked there's so many things so for me particularly they said all my eggs were fine um, but they weren't sure if I ovulated every month but we'll talk about how you can get through that you can skip all that by using 
hormones and injections to make all that stuff happen. And then I did have one fallopian tube that was blocked and we just fixed that with surgery. So a lot of things, a lot of challenges in life aren't challenges if you just just find a way to get past it. But for me, particularly, I wasn't in love and love and love with being pregnant. I was in love and love and love with being a mom. So I did try assisted reproductive technology, which we say art, and there's a lot of different things that you can do, but we ended up adopting. So we have our little monkey, and he's super rad. So we'll talk more about that. So again, adoption, I'm a huge fan. So if you guys ever want to talk about that, I did use a nonprofit um, agency here in Orange County, and um, they were super awesome. So really, really love it. And then in November is National Adoption Month, and so all the families get together. It's really, really cool. So um, you can do uh, international adoptions as well. Um, we have two other kids in our family who are internationally adopted, and so all of the grandkids on one side of the family are adopted, which is really, really cool. So that is our culture. That is our norm. Adoption is, is the deal. Uh, I want to make sure that you guys see this right here because I couldn't I couldn't help myself, right? Adoption poem, the gift of life. I didn't give you the gift of life, but in my heart I know. The love I feel is deep and real as if it had been so. For us to have each other is like a dream come true. No, I didn't give you the gift of life. Life gave me the gift of you. And yes, it's touching because can you imagine wanting so much to be a mom and then you can't and then then somebody says yeah here you can have my baby it is the most a miracle of miracles but at the same time let's go back here at the same time you can birth him or you can adopt him and you still get a crazy kid so i love him to death but it's not easy <laughs> I don't know if anybody's like, oh, mother, that's so, it's easy. No. And we'll talk more about that. <laughs> um, so assisted reproductive technology or art, or there's different ways to do it. So artificial insemination is the fancy word of saying, or people say the turkey baster. Um, let's see. My little guy might be coming in. Peyton, you want to come say hi? Hi, come say hi. Hi. Do you want to say, it's not live. We're just recording. You want to say hi to the students? Hi, students. Tell them, how, say my name is? My name is Peyton. And I am? And I'm 11 years old. And I, and I just got back from? You just got back from a long bike ride. Like how long? Like 15 miles. Like about 15 miles. Oh my gosh, is that why you're dirty and you smell like a boy? Are they recording? Is it, is it taking, can they see me? Well, it's going to record it like a YouTube video. Will they be able to see me? Well, yeah, when they watch the video, they can see you. Wait, is the dog in here? Get the dog out because like, she's going to go. Is she hiding? Okay, shut the door. Love you. Almost on cue. Almost on cue. I didn't expect that. They would have that out riding their bike, and here they are. So artificial, let's go back. Artificial insemination, um, sometimes they just take a turkey baster and literally put the sperm way up high so the sperm doesn't have to travel all the way through the, um, the vagina, and sometimes that helps, and sometimes people get pregnant. Um, the next time there's this, uh, there's another thing where they do this artificial insemination right here. This, that's what they mean, turkey baster. It's really a tube, and they, it's this long skinny tube, and it goes all the way up here. And they're hoping that when they poke it and they like let out the sperm, it will Im get closer to the egg, and then you know, and then fertilize and implant. And if that doesn't work, again. They use all kinds of medicine to make sure everything is lined up. But if that doesn't work, you go to in vitro fertilization, which means they take, and we, I have a video, they take the eggs out of me, take the husband's sperm or the partner's sperm, put them together, and then fertilize them, and then put them back in. So in vitro, meaning in vitro actually means like a Petri dish. They make the baby in there, and then they implant it. So, But what happens is that the ovum transfer, that just means the fertilized eggs, goes they take the ovum out they fertilize the egg put it back in then intracytoplasmic injection or sperm injection in ICSI that's where they actually take uh, um, a, like they inject the sperm into the ova so just to be just to let you know you can actually see if you pull up a pencil like at the very end of a pencil you can actually see a woman's egg that's about how big it is like the the end of a pencil a sperm you can't really see but they get a needle so tight and they put it in there it's crazy so we did go through that and the legal and ethical issues that comes with that is we had to sign a lot of paperwork um, because we froze our embryos I had four embryos frozen and what if you know we got divorced or what if somebody died or 
you know, and then what happens after 18 months, we paid for the freezer space. And then after 18 months, we decided to uh, donate to science so people could learn something. So there's a lot of interesting legal and ethical issues. And there's like, like celebrities who go through that. And so you guys can look, look that up if you're interested. Um, let's see if I can find that one video. Um, let's go back and forth. Okay, that's a little bit clearer. Right, so yeah, it's pretty invasive, and by the way, you do feel it. So it doesn't hurt, but it feels like a pinch or a poke. It's like, uh, you know, it's there's a lot of people going through it. So I just feel I just tell people, go as far down the um, the ART, the art artificial means, go as far down that rabbit hole as you want. If you just want to have a baby, you know, keep going. But if you do, you want to be a mom, adopt. You know, it's a sure thing, right? With the IVF, it's like forty percent. But with adoption, you 100% get a kid, right? So let's talk more about genes and then heredity, how that kid got to look like him and how I got to look like me and how you get to look like you, okay? So our genetic code, this is, we've all heard this term, DNA, it's deoxyribonucleic acid. Let's say it together. Deoxy, say that as the emphasis, deoxyribonucleic nucleic acid it's this chemical that carries this dna carries the instruction it's almost like the blueprint right and these little things are kind of wrapped up in here right and when we put all these together in these chromosomes remember half from the mom half from the dad yeah and right here this is a this would be a position for like eye color down here would be a position for maybe like breast cancer or alcoholism or tallness right and so in this there could be, in this chain, there could be three billion base pairs wrapped around just one chromosome. Ah, that's crazy, right? It's your blueprint. Um, and so make sure that you know, make, again, make sure that you know that the chromosomes are like the little X's, and inside the chromosomes are genes. So almost like Legos, like teeny tiny Legos that make up those little X's, okay? Now, we talked about a zygote, right, is when we have the male and the female gametes come together, and then they have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so 46 total. So remember, 23 pairs, you will be tested on this, 46 total, okay, and it has about 40,000 genes providing that blueprint. So you'll see, like if we could name this as chromosome 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, here's 6, this is part the top part of the X and the, and the bottom part of the X, right? Top part and top and bottom. It'll tell you right here. So chromosome 6, HFE, this could be, again, hair color, eye color, height, weight. Like you, There's a bunch of things that are immediate. And then some of them are turned on a little bit more with in, uh, environment and some are turned on, turned down with environment too. So we'll talk about that as well. The genetic code, so if you took every single one, let's go back, if you took every single one of these chromosomes and laid them out and did this whole layout with them, you're going to get the full genetic code that called the human genome map. So every single person on this planet has a genome map that looks just like this. And if you look at this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 22 pairs, and this last pair is the one that determines our gender, our sex, right? So it's really kind of interesting because people can map out all these things. And if you've done maybe 23andMe or Ancestry.com, you can get, even your doctor would do something like this in certain situations. But you can get this full-on map, and this will tell you alcoholism, breast cancer, colon cancer, um, height, weight. Intelligence is a little bit more than just one. Um, things like that. Adaptability is a little bit more than one. Temperament is a little bit more than one. So it's really kind of interesting to know. So if you're interested in doing that, go ahead and look that up and go for it. I'm thinking about doing it. And again, we want to make sure that 22, you know, 22 of those pairs are the autosomes. They're actually the blueprints. And then the last one, this last one, let's go back, it has to do with gender. See how it says XY? This actually is the expression for male xy in the normal human male and xx in the normal human female and the way to remember that is ladies we is extra large what right so i it's really easy to remember if women are xx right or maybe think of like an emoji like the like the laughing emoji or something or maybe even the <sighs> emoji that's what i think most women look like half the time <sighs> right two x's right so again, 22 of the pairs are considered autosomes, and it's not autosome or 
like um, like anything crazy to think of. 22 pairs have to do with everything, and then the last pair has to do with our sex. Now, when we talk about defects or um, abnormalities or mutations, sometimes there's an X, XY. Sometimes there's an X, Y, Y. So again, there's there could be mutations on any of these autosomes, but over here when we have a mutation on the sex chromosome, then we see some pretty distinctive characteristics, and we'll talk about that in a second. Again, so genetic transmission, if we're going to get genetic material from right half our mom, half our dad, how does it actually show up, right? So in my family, there's four siblings, and two of them look like me. So me and my little sister look like this, like blonder hair, lighter eyes, lighter skin, and then the other two, darker hair, darker skin, darker eyes. So in your family, it might work like that too, and we'll talk about that. So these are the four things that we're going to talk about, the alleles, dominant recessive inheritance, mutations, and multifactorial transmission. Again, remember, this is a chromosome, and this is a gene. The gene is the tiny one, and the chromosome is the big one. Think of it this way. Gene is a small world word, so it's a small thing. Chromosome is a longer word, so it's a bigger thing. Does that make sense? Good. Let's see if I can get get an idea here. Mendel's peas. Oh, yeah, I don't know why these things do not want to work. Um, let's see if I have it in here. Mendel's peas in our module. Let's do this. Where do we have Mendel's peas? Okay, let me see if I can find it here. Mendel's peas. This is how we figured out which, how genetics work by looking at peas in the garden. No joke. Let's see if I can find it. Something that's super easy. Yeah, here it is. This one's so cute. This is from Ted um, Ted Ed. So it's like TED Talks, but just shorter and just for educational purposes. These days, scientists know how you inherit characteristics from your parents. They're able to calculate probabilities of having a specific trait or getting a genetic disease according to the information they have from the parents and the family history. But how is this possible? To understand how traits pass from one living being to its descendants, we need to go back in time to the 19th century and a man named Gregor Mendel. Mendel was an Austrian monk and biologist who loved to work with plants. By breeding the pea plants he was growing in the monastery's garden, he discovered the principles that rule heredity. In one of the most classic examples, Mendel combined a purebred yellow-seeded plant with a purebred green-seeded plant, and he got only yellow seeds. He called the yellow color trait the dominant one because it was expressed in all the new seeds. Then he let the new yellow-seeded hybrid plants self-fertilize, and in this second generation he got both yellow and green seeds, which meant that the green trait had been hidden by the dominant yellow. He called this hidden trait the recessive trait. From those results, Mendel inferred that each trait depends on a pair of factors, one of them coming from the mother and the other from the father. Now we know that these factors are called alleles and represent the different variations of a gene. Depending on which type of allele Mendel found in each seed, we can have what we call a homozygous P, where both alleles are identical, and what we call a heterozygous P, when the two alleles are different. This combination of alleles is known as genotype, and its result, being yellow or green, is called phenotype. To clearly visualize how alleles are distributed amongst descendants, we can use a diagram called the Punnett square. You just place the different alleles on both axes, and then you figure out the possible combinations. Let's look at Mendel's P's, for example. Let's write the dominant yellow allele as an uppercase Y, and the recessive green allele as a lowercase Y. The uppercase Y always overpowers his lowercase friend, so the only time you'd get green babies is if you have two lowercase Ys. In Mendel's first generation, the yellow homozygous P mom will give each P kid a yellow dominant allele, and the green homozygous P dad will give a green recessive allele, so all the P kids will be yellow heterozygous. Then, in the second generation, where the two heterozygous kids marry, their babies could have any of the three possible genotypes, showing the two possible phenotypes in a 3 to 1 proportion. But even peas have a lot of characteristics. For example, besides being yellow or green, peas may be round or wrinkled. So we could have all these possible so combinations. Round yellow peas, round green peas, wrinkled yellow peas, and wrinkled green peas. To calculate the proportions for each genotype and phenotype, we can use a Punnett square, too. You will not of course, this will make it a little more square. complex. Maybe in biology. And lots class. of things are more complicated than peas. Like, say, people. These days, scientists know a lot more about <laughs> genetics and heredity. And there are many other ways in which some characteristics are inherited. 
But it all started with Mendel and his peas. Very cute. Very cute. Very cute. So I will make sure that we have a copy of that. Yeah? Let's make sure we're not doing any more. Good. Okay, go back here. So Mendel and his peas, he really figured out that genetic transmission has to do with dominant genes and recessive genes. So, um, hold on, let me go back. Pretty, that's pretty awesome, but no, thank you. So, like, for example, a lot, the most common eye color on the planet is brown. And so that is a dominant gene for brown eyes. And so that would be usually a big B, and I have, I have some graphics for that. And then, like, a blue eye would be recessive. So, right, and then even more recessive would be a green eye, right? So um, I have green eyes because my grandmother has green eyes. So it's, it's skipped to generation. That's what they mean. The genetics, the dominant ones show through, but then there's always having um, my little sister has blue eyes, so there she has two of the recessive genes for blue eyes. So in my family, we have two browns, one blue, one green. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Yeah, so again, let me scooch back through here. Now, again, this dominant and recessive inheritance, the only time you're going to see the recessive genes show up is if they're doubled. Like if the two Bs are small, then you'll get it. But if you get a big B and a little B, no, they're always going to show the big B. So let's see here. So for example, uh, she's got like curly hair, right? And dad has maybe like a little, like a more straight hair, let's say, right? So she passed on curly hair to all of them, right? Except for he passed on straight hair to all of them, right? So half of them, one comes out curly like hers, one comes out wavy. Hers has a little bit of wave and his is kind of straight, right? So this is how this multifactorial transmission, this is the dominant in their, in their family, the dominant gene is the curly hair here. So dominant, dominant, slightly dominant, and then this one, he has the double recessive here, which is kind of cool. So chances are somebody in his family before him, his parents both had straight hair, or even one has straight with a recessive curl to get this one with a recessive slight curl. Get it? We'll talk more about that. Okay. And some of these, these, again, these have to do with the genes and how it's expressed, but there are some traits that are only expressed on the sex gene, the XY chromosome. So we'll talk more about that. So again, here is the dominant is brown, the recessive is blue. And so if you have two blue parents, look at this, right? But if you have a blue parent and a brown parent, you're going to get this, right? If you have both brown eyes, you're going to have this. But before them, maybe this is brown and this is a little blue, right? right? So if you have, look at brown, 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 blue, you might have one over here that's blue. It's kind of interesting. It has to do, make sure you know what alleles means. Two or more alternative forms of a gene that can occupy the same position on a paired chromosome. So those chromosomes are like this, and this side will be the blue eye, and this side will be the brown eye. And again, having that mix of the dominant and recessive is how it shows up. Okay, now mutations are differences, right? Again, people kind of freak out and, you know, it's not an X-Men deal, but if we didn't have mutations, we wouldn't have more than one butterfly. We wouldn't have more than one rose. We wouldn't have polar bears. Polar bears started as black bears, right? And then they, there was a mutation in their gene. They turned white. Had to do with their, the needs of the environment, right? So if you see this, uh, to people with two different colored eyes, it's called uh, heterochromium. I have centrified, like centered heterochromium, but it's the same on both eyes kind of interesting, not super rare, just means I have a ring of color, a band of color. Homeboy here has one, two, three, four, five, six fingers. Uh, don't know if this one works, but that's really kind of interesting. It's just part of our evolution, right? You can go out right right now, look outside, and you that's why we have four leaf clovers and, and mostly three, but a lot of fours. But they're rare, right? Same with flowers. They usually have five or six petals, but you'll find one that's different. Or even if you go to the farmer's market and you buy a pepper and then you cut it open, there's a pepper inside. There's mutations. It's life, right? That's what happens, okay? This is kind of cool. I want people to realize is that originally all humans had brown eyes. Then about 8,000 years ago, a mutation occurred. The code for tyrosine switched to S bear again. Less tyrosine, which turns brown, led to blue colored eyes, which see slightly better at night, but slightly worse during the day. Amazingly, this mutation occurred in only one single human. Thus, all blue-eyed people are related. Crazy. And there are people who have yellow eyes and even purple eyes. So you guys can look that up too. It's cool. 
Uh, and now multifactorial transmission. Think of some genes that are like a light switch. You know, it's not just a flip flip. It's like a dimmer switch. It goes on, like intelligence, height, um, like being flexible, being kind, those things. They have like, uh, there's more than one thing that goes into turning that gene on or off. So again, you can have two sisters in the same house that are two different heights. My older sister is short. My little sister is tall so there's complex traits and then IQ is our smarts and EQ is our right our psychosocial smarts our intel our um, emotional quotient our intelligence quotient and our emotional quotient and all these things have multifactorial transmission it's not just one so polygenic inheritance means many gene inheritance okay so let's see what do we have next oh epigen epigenesis oh i love this one it's so cool make sure you know so epigenesis is the mechanism that turns genes on or off it is the light switch the dimmer switch right make sure you know the definition for genotype that is on page this one's really easy to remember okay genotype page 35 genotype is your genes no not the denim you're wearing genes your genes that make up all your blueprint of who you are, right? The genes inside the chromosome. But the phenotype is that expression of those genes. So this is how I like to think about it. Phenotype this looks like photograph, right? How I would spell photograph. So that's why I put this one here. So genotype, wait, let's go back. Genotype is your genes and phenotype is your what you look like, right? So my genes, I have the same genes as my siblings, but I don't look the same as them because my phenotype, the expression, is a little bit different. So I like I like putting this one here. We have maybe a Caucasian guy, maybe there's some redhead in his family behind him, like it is siblings, maybe his hair is a tiny bit red, and then she's maybe like Pacific Islander, Hawaiian or something, and then we have a red and a kid. So the genes are in there. Her phenotype is the same as the genetics that she got from her parents will be the same as her sibling but her phenotype is red hair her photograph is red hair good okay good so let's see if we can get this next video to work because this one's really really cool and I don't know why it doesn't work uh, let's go back here this one is really cool I mentioned it in chapter one but this is where we talk about it cha chapter two it is like Mm, it's like nine minutes, but it's good. So if you need to pause, come back. So say you have a clone or a secret identical twin because you know that a twin or a clone is a genetically identical person to you, which is crazy, uh, but it's true. Anyway, so you have this clone or your twin or what have you and your parents decide that it's too much trouble to keep both of you. And so they give your clone to a kind of sketchy traveling circus. Now I know your parents probably wouldn't actually do this, but just roll with me for a minute. So for the purposes of this example, let's just say that you grew up living a normal suburban American life while your clone grew up with less stability and less access to nutritious food and less education, but more exercise and more access to sword swallowers and bearded ladies. And let's say you guys are 50 years old or whatever, and you get together and have some lunch. So you're sitting there across the table from your clone. What do you think you see? Well, for starters, Clone probably has a tattoo on its face. And if Clone had stayed in the circus, Clone probably, you know, professionally rides a unicycle over a tightrope, so Clone is probably in pretty good shape. But then again, Clone probably smokes cigarettes and probably was malnourished as a child, so might be slightly shorter than you. By the same token, let's say that you've been eating Sonic Tater Tots five days a week since 1992, so you're looking a little bit tubby. Plus, you spent the last 20 years at a really stressful job that puts you at risk for all kinds of weird health complications. So, at 50, you and Clone would probably look pretty in the exact same order. But on another level, there would be a huge difference. And if we extend this metaphor, we can say that the letters are in the same order, but the spaces and the punctuation are all in different places. Of course, completely potentially changing the message of that paragraph. The study of this genetic punctuation that I'm talking about is called epigenetics, which literally means above genetics. The epigenome doesn't change your DNA, but it decides how much or whether some genes are expressed in different cells in your body. Epigenetics looks at what happens to your genes over the course of your life 
and whether those changes could be passed down to your children or even your grandchildren. So here's the way epigenetics works. You have billions of cells in your body and they each contain your DNA, the same exact blueprint of your genetic code. But just because they have the DNA doesn't mean that they know what to do with it. They need outside instruction from these little carbon and hydrogen compounds called methyl groups. The way these methyl groups control the genome is by binding to a gene and saying, do not express this gene. The methyl groups bind differently to your genome in a skin cell versus, say, a tongue cell or an eyeball cell. And that is one of the ways that a cell knows that, hey, I'm a skin cell, or hey, I'm an eyeball cell, or hey, I'm a muscle cell. In addition to methyl groups, epigenetics is also controlled by histones, which are proteins that are basically the spools that DNA winds itself around. Histones can change how tightly or loosely the DNA is wound around them. If they're more loosely wound, the genes can express more, and if they're more tightly wound, then they express less. So whereas the methyl groups are more like a switch, the histones are more like a knob. Every cell in your body has a distinct methylation and histone pattern. And that is what gives every cell its marching orders. Think of your genome, the DNA, as the actual hardware of the computer, while the epigenome is more like the software, which tells the hardware what to do. The genome is what's going to be doing all the work, but the epigenome is going to be telling it what to do. So the hardware of your DNA is going to be the same throughout your entire life. But these epigenetic tags do change throughout your life and they decide what genes get expressed or not. Now, epigenetic information in a cell isn't permanent. It can change throughout your life, and it can be hereditary. And it can change over time, especially when your body is going through a lot of changes, like, say, during puberty. A bunch of methyl groups kick in and they're like, okay, so you guys over here, you're gonna have to start growing hair, and you guys over here, I really need you guys to get behind giving this guy some really horrible acne. Or like, when you get pregnant, which hopefully I won't, but when you do, your epigenome has to be like, all right guys, everything's about to get a whole lot bigger in here and we're gonna have to pass something the size of like a Merriam-Webster's dictionary through that little pipe over there, so let's get this thing done. But it's not just these dramatic times when the epigenome is changing, it changes subtly throughout our entire lives. And it changes based on a lot of environmental factors like what we do, what we eat, what we smoke, and how stressed out we are on a daily basis. Scientists have found that things like a bad diet can actually lead to methyl groups binding to the wrong place and making mistakes. And with those bad instructions, cells become abnormal and become a disease. And then basically all hell breaks loose and you get cancer or something. Epigenetics is a very young science, though we've known about the epigenome since the 1970s. It's only in the last 20 years that we've even known what effect these epigenetic tags are having on our DNA. And even after they got all that business straight, scientists still thought that all of our epigenetic tags were stripped mm, off of our grammar. genome before they were passed on to our children. Grammar. So if you started smoking 10 packs a day when you were 10 years old, that would certainly be a horrible health decision for you, but you wouldn't necessarily be harming your unborn children in any measurable way. However, the thinking on that is changing pretty rapidly. Because it's true that a lot, even most, of the epigenetic information from a parent is stripped off of the embryo's genome in the first few days, and fresh ones are created specifically for this new person. However, some of these tags get stuck on the genome and are passed down from generation to generation. And it just so happens that the more they study this, the more it looks like bad epigenetic information is being passed from generation to generation. And this is a whole new way to think about how we pass information between generations. Your grandmother was making dietary decisions that affect you today. As we experience all of these new strange epidemics, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, cancers, that weren't appearing in previous generations, it's starting to look like these may be caused by epigenetic information passed down from our parents. I know, it's such an ASD, unbelievable buzzkill. Uh, there is no point in our lives when we can do anything without algae. guilt anymore. The discovery that the environmental factors of parent experiences can be passed down from generation to generation <laughs> was sparked in the 1980s. And this happened when some scientists were looking at the birth and death records of some people who lived in 19th century Sweden. As is a weird place, to find a genetic revolution, but there it is. It wasn't just any place in Sweden. It was in Norrbotten, which is uh, the northernmost county in Sweden, which is literally in the Arctic Circle. And despite the fact that Norrbotten was literally the worst place you could possibly choose to live in Sweden, <laughs> there were some people living there in the 1800s. And they were completely cut off from the rest of the world. Let me clarify. These people were isolated. Like, if they didn't have a good crop year, people died. No, it wasn't ideal, but, you know, they didn't ask me my opinion, so I'm not giving it. So anyway, these people subsisted entirely on what they grew and the animals that they raised. And like I said, sometimes they starved, but sometimes they had huge, bountiful years of plenty. And what happened? People totally went ape crackers. I mean, of course they did, because they were so freaking hungry, and then all of a sudden there was all this damn food everywhere. Anyway, 
There was a public health specialist who was looking at the effects of the people who grew up in the really bad starving periods of time versus the people who grew up in the eat all you can at the smorgasbord years. And you might already be guessing what they found out. People who went from relatively slim pickings to feed your face until you have to barf and then do it all over again in a single season, those people died an average of six years sooner than their starved out counterparts. And you know what sucks? So do their kids. And so do their kids' kids. Boo epigenetics. So, of course, now we all know, and we're all going to stop doing unhealthy things starting today. Unless the damage is already done. The damage is almost certainly already <laughs> done. But hey, uh, epigenetics brings good tidings along with the bad ones. For instance, we now know that certain types of cancer are caused by misplaced epigenetic tags. And scientists are now developing drugs that can silence the bad genes that were supposed to be turned off in the first place. Additionally, until recently, we thought that genes were the end-all and be-all of who you got to be. They were your blueprint, and you couldn't escape them. This outlook is not just kind of depressing, it also leads to a yucky sort of social prejudice. Because when you look at data without considering social and epigenetic factors, it might look like people with less money are less intelligent. So just like 15 years ago, there were scientists saying things in public, mind you, like some people just have good genes for intelligence, and it just so happens that the poor people don't. Oh, it's so sad. Too bad, poor people. But you have bad genes. Well, it turns out that that is not even a little bit true. Not only are there a huge variety of social factors that affect how well people do on intelligence tests, but a genetic trait is also not just a product of genes. It's also a product of environment. Any one person's genome is determined by any number of decisions made by any number of their ancestors. And right now, you are making decisions that are going to affect people who are alive long after you're dead. No pressure or anything. And so I'm glad you've watched this. Because when you and your clone are in your 60s and you sit down, have lunch, and he brings his son and his son has a tattoo on his face, he did not inherit that from you. This is Hank Green for the SciShow. We hope you learned something. <laughs>
um, but her sister does not. Um, dimples, right? People just thought, oh, is it because you're fat? No, it's actually a deformation, right? Some people have one on one side and on the other. Um, brown or black hair, blonde hair, blonde hair is recessive. Um, freckles, do you have some? Do you have a couple? Do you have a lot? Brown eyes versus blue eyes. And then the free earlobe, do you have like an earlobe that's actually like, or attached? Mine's like half and half. I have like a little one, but it's kind of attached on the side, so mine's not super dominant or recessive, kind of interesting. So a lot of different things, but it just depends on what's in your genome, all right? So now there's sex links inheritance things. So there are some things like hemophilia, blood disorders, rare um, genetic issues that a mother can carry and pass on to her, her children, or a father can carry and pass on to her children. For example, I carry the recessive gene for cystic fibrosis, which tends to show up in the white Caucasian community, and it has to do with lung capacity. And kids who are born with cystic fibrosis have to have two of the recessive genes. Now, thankfully, I did get my, my genetic map done. I didn't really get a copy of it. The doctor just did it. And then my husband got his done to see if he had the negative. So if we both have the negative or the recessive allele for that, then we would have a child with 25% chance of cystic fibrosis. And those kids have a kind of a hard life because they can't really breathe and they can't really do much and they don't live till about 30. Yeah, so it's it's a rough life. So a lot of people sometimes don't even want to have kids in that respect. And I'm again, I'm glad that my husband was fine. I'm not, but um, one of my parents or maybe both has it and I got to adopt. So I don't have to have a kid with cystic fibrosis. fibrosis. Um, my husband's cousin carries hemophilia which just means that there's the blood it has no clotting properties and if you hit a kid like this they can bleed like on the inside and sometimes if you hit them hard enough they could die like from bleeding that bleeding never stops and so she knew that uh, if it follows on the Y if all uh, it follows on the X chromosome she's the carrier she passed it to her son now her daughter may have the recessive gene and pass it to her son but we don't know yet, right, because their kids are little. So again, so if one parent has, let's say it's, uh, let's say it's cystic fibrosis and say it was my dad, he has, can pass it on to two of the kids, right? So an affected son, affected daughter, 25% chance, yeah? But if it is, same thing here, we have an affected male, he has a dominant and recessive, he passes on to a carrier female, carrier female. That doesn't mean she has it, just means she carries it, and then she goes ahead and passes it down to her kids. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So some of these genetic mutations will show up on the sex chromosome, right? And sometimes people, are, they, at first they thought Down syndrome was like that, and it has nothing to do with that. And we'll talk more about that in a second, okay? Make sure you know what sex-linked inheritance is. This is a good question on the test. Now, genetic and chromosomal abnormalities, when you have uh, Down syndrome, I didn't put here, it's an extra chromosome. So it's either, I'm sorry, it's uh, XYY, okay? So it's called trisomy, but if you have XXY, it's Kleinfelter. So let's talk about that for a second. Interestingly enough, my dad's sister uh, had Down syndrome, and so I didn't even know what that was growing up with it because it was just, you know, part of the family. If you want to learn more about that, uh, take my 205 class. It's online. Love to have you. Um, so Down syndrome, well, this is pretty common, and it's, again, a trisomy. It's when there's um, three chromosomes together, so it's XYY. And then this other one here, this one is going to be, um, you're going to see this right here, um, Turner syndrome. You're going to see this. They have this phenotype. They have this look to them, right? Now, Kleinfelter's is XXY. It can have a boy who kind of has a, some female characteristics and a girl that has kind of male characteristics and they tend to not develop property during pr properly during puberty so we just do a lot of um, genetic testing or I'm sorry genetic testing and then some hormones like injections and so my sister-in-law had this but a very mild case of it and so she didn't she was really short and really stocky but she didn't she didn't know until she was older and she had trouble going through puberty. So just used a lot of medication. But both of these types of people, Kleinfelter's and um, Down syndrome and even Turner syndrome, where they have one X chromosome and they're missing the other one, that's this one here, um, they, none of these people can have children. They are infertile. They cannot go ahead and have an offspring. They can't. So none of these people can then 
have more or more chromosomal abnormalities. It stops there with them. Yeah, good. Got that? So Klinefelter is this XXY, Down syndrome is XYY, and Turner syndrome is X missing. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Again, there's so many different things that can happen. It's called life. Yeah. Now, genetic counseling is just where people have can speak to a, like a social worker, and they have they talk about options. Now, going back here, people will tend to end pregnancies if they know ahead of time, which they can. You can tell when a woman is pregnant if any of these things would occur by doing an amniocentesis. That's what this is. Okay, so before you get pregnant, people ask you, do you have any, um, like, Down syndrome in your family? Do you have any, um, gene like, any genetic things that can get passed along? And, yeah, I mean, I knew that was part of my genetics. Um, the amniocentesis, my mom did this when she was pregnant with my little sister because she was, my mom was having trouble getting pregnant, staying pregnant. And so they literally take out fluid from the amniotic sac, where the, you know, all the fluid that the baby's in. They take with a, with a needle right? They take it out and then um, they can then test for the, right here, they can look for the XXY, the XO, or the XYY. Isn't that cool? They can look for that. So some people do end pregnancies that way. So talking with a genetic counselor is up to them, right? And no matter what you believe, other people have other beliefs and people get to make their own choices, right? But again, a lot of times you can find out these things beforehand. But certain issues like ADHD or autism, that's not, there's no genetic markers for that yet. So just keep, just know that there is different, um, there's like different options, right? Now, when we talk about heredity and the environment, just like the epigenesis, epigenesis, it's not just your genes and it's not just the environment, it's how those things work together, right? So I have a friend of mine who's going through cancer treatment right now, and she was a smoker, but I also have another friend who has cancer, and she was never a smoker. They both have lung cancer. One was a smoker, one was never a smoker, but the never smoker lived in a house where everybody did smoke. So it's really kind of interesting to see people going through this thing, and um how the doctors react to it and how the people believe that it, how much the environment is or is not a factor. It's kind of interesting, right? And let's talk about how those work together. Now, heritability is a statistical significance. Like, how much can you inherit? It's heritability. It's kind of a funky word, right? But there's three ways to figure out heritability. So you guys met Peyton. If Peyton had a twin and they were separated and then you could see how they turned out similarly, or not, or differently, then you could tell their nature made them the same or their environment made them different, right? So a twin study, a family stop, a study, or adoption study. So yeah, Peyton has siblings, and so we're, it's kind of interesting to see how they all kind of turn out, okay? So for example, if you have two twins adopted by different families, they, are, they grew up totally different. Um, if they grew up in the different environments, but their intelligence is the same, it's genetics right? If their intelligence is different, it's environment. So what if one adoptive parent was like, oh, no, you don't have to study, and the other adoptive parent was like, you better study your butt off, right? So maybe one's genetics and maybe one is environment. That's how we could figure it out. The different DNA, same environment. If one sibling is adopted and the intelligence is the same, it's likely due to the environment, the parents, the culture, pushing through school, right? But if the intelligence is different, it's likely due to genetics, Okay, so for example, my niece and nephew are adopted from Korea. They are adopted from the same place, two years apart, and they're both really smart kids. So you can attribute that to the parents really pushing for education, but there is regular teenage stuff going on here. So you see this, this environmental aspect of, you know, just being a teenager and things like that. So they are genetically two different people. Uh, born in, a two, in like the same area and adopted to the same family, but you can tell their intelligence is a little different, but their achievement is sort of the same. It's kind of interesting. So is it nature or nurture? Is it genes or is it the environment? Interesting, right? So how things work together, right? And a trait strongly influenced by heredity, the environment can have a substantial impact. So for example, Peyton Maybe he came from a family who was really good at skateboarding or just very, very athletic. Now, he comes to my family, and let's say we, he, I adopt him, but I'm not good at sports or skateboarding, and so I don't really bring it into his world. How do I know he would be good at that? 
right? So environmental interventions sometimes can overcome genetically determined conditions. For example, he, uh, I love my son, but he doesn't have tempo, rhythm, or tone, but he loves music. So we got him a keyboard, we got him a turntable, and he plays the keyboard, just kind of like bebops around with it, with the tones and the music and all the little, and you know, the, the beats and stuff like that. And then we have records on a turntable, and he loves it too, but when he... I'm musical, so am I in introducing him to musical stuff, but he's not naturally musical, right? So environmental in interventions sometimes can overcome genetically determined conditions. Maybe he was never going to be a good singer or dancer, but with my pushing, maybe he would be, right? So heredity and environment do work together. So when, it, when people say, is it nature versus nurture, I think it's 50-50. <laughs> Nobody likes that answer. Now, if we have genotype environment interaction, so I mentioned to you earlier, my older sister is short and my little sister is big. So so we all came from the same place, but my little sister is literally the same height as my dad, same height as my brother. And so what happened is that my older sister was in gymnastics, and then you get this, these gymnasts who are really short, right? And then my little sister, when she was born in the 80s, they gave my mom drugs because they weren't sure about the pregnancy. So my little sister is like almost six foot tall. Effects of similar environmental conditions on genetically different ind individuals. Now, these are genetically different individuals. In my house, we just had two different environments on genetically similar. So that let's go back here. That would be genetically similar. And this would be genetically different, right? So you can have a tall person and a short person in this in the same family, but if they were both like different genetically and they have the same environmental interactions, it really kind of depends, right? Right. Oh, by the way, she's a swimmer. She's a gymnast. So swimmers, long, lean, gymnast, short, stocky. Yeah, both athletic. Now, genotype environment correlation means how they go together. So not to freak out anybody, but... When a woman is pregnant right now in the United States, she has 50 toxins in her body that were not present at her birth. So when a woman is pregnant now in the United States, she has 50 toxins in her body that were not present in her body when she was a baby. So we pick up environmental toxins. It could be the pesticides from our food. It could be the stuff in the air. It could be anything. It could be lead paint. So in here, let's see if I got it any closer. Yes. So check this out. So your genotype is here. These are your genes. And then there's these complex interactions like the like the epigenetics, right? Effects may depend on functional genetic polymorphisms. How that light switch turns on, right? So if the mom was exposed to viruses, bacteria, um, I think this is mercury, antioxidants, prebiotics, folate, allergens, pollutants, these are the environmental exposures, and then maybe her tissue screened it out. Maybe her immune system screened it out. Maybe antenatal means like during pregnancy, did she, was the, was the kid exposed to it or not? Right. Really interested about this because he had this from another woman and then he had this, right? And then postnatal, he had this from me. So, right? Nature versus nurture is crazy. But again, this evolving phenotype means our photograph are evolving what we look like. When he was born, he had red hair and it was kind of straight. He didn't always have curly brown hair, right? And then are there transgenerational effects? Maybe. Yeah. One of his brothers has kind of a sandy blondish hair and it's not so curly. So I'm curious to see if he like marries a white girl, if he has like redheaded kids. We'll see, right? We don't know right? And reaction range and canalization just means how much. So like if you look here, how much does that gene express? So if you see all these redheaded kids, there's this one's maybe a deeper red and this one's not quite so red. Let's assume this is the mom, right? And maybe, I don't know, maybe she adopted them, but let's say this is the mom and the dad has redhead. They're different color reds. And then you have a curly one here. You have a little bit of a wave here. This one's not so red. So that's the, the range right? The reaction range, a term for a range of expressions of a hereditary trait, depending on environmental opportunities and constraints. And I all know that when we have hair, we want it a different color. We want it, if it's curly, we want it straight. If it's straight, we want it curly, right? And then the canalization, it's a limitation, right? Meaning if you have a gene, either dominant or recessive for curly hair, it's never going to be curlier than the person who gave it to you. 
that's kind of an advanced technique there. So it's a variance of expression. It's a limitation, right? They're not going to have, like, red hair that's, like, purple red, right? There's lots of different reds. Or they're not going to have Ronald McDonald red, right? There's limitations, okay? So we're doing good here. All right. Now, what makes siblings so different? Now, I've shared with you my sibling situations, and we are, our personalities are different, our careers are different, our lifestyles are different. It's crazy. All four of us, super, super different. I don't even know if we have anything in common. It's crazy, right? Oops, sorry. Let's go back. And this is funny. Are you a firstborn, a middle, last, or only, right? And some people say, well, only children act a certain way because that's their environment. Well, yes. But what is their temperament as well? Firstborns, they're always the leaders because they have to be. Well, what if they don't want to be, right? Which one are you, right? The non-shared environmental effects has to do with the unique environment in which each child grows up. So in my house, we had my brother who's an only child for two or three years. Then we had my sister, and then we had me, and then we had my little sister who was last born, right? Let's do this one. My brother was an only child, but then he turned into a firstborn. And then my, I had an older sister and us, me, her, we share the middle, and then my little sister. So just to share with you, that's two kids born in the 60s, one born in the 70s, and one born in the 80s. So do you think life was different between the 60s and the 80s? Yeah. And when my parents were letting my little sister get away with murder, I was like, what? This is totally not cool. We, I had all these rules. And my mom said, I'm old and tired. <laughs> right? So maybe some of you ha recognize that as well. Siblings are so different because we have non-shared environmental effects. We all went to the same high school. I tell you, most of us had the same teachers. We just, we had a unique environment for each of us growing up, right? My brother was kind of like a burnout. My other sister, my older sister was kind of like super flirt. And I was like a, like a band nerd. And my little sister was, she got suspended for drinking in the ninth grade. So yeah, so we all had different temperaments and different environments in which we grew up, and then we had different birth orders. So which one are you, and what do you think it has to do with that non-shared environmental effect? Okay, we're headed toward the home stretch. So again, now we have we have some characteristics are influenced by heredity and environment, like we've talked about. Obesity. Here's the funny thing: I'm a big girl, but I don't. I know that there's big people in my in my genetics, right? But I also know that I can lose weight and go to the gym and get fit. That's also shows up. So that's that dimmer switch where people say, well, I'm just fat because my family's fat. It's like, yeah, but you can turn on or turn off that heredity and environment dimmer switch, right? Same thing with intelligence. You can either apply yourself and work really hard and turn that up or just be like, no, I don't want to try so hard. Your choice, right? That's environment and um, heredity. Now, again, there's more, like temperament, right? Sometimes you, if you're a chill person, you're going to have chill kids, right? If you're kind of like neurotic, meaning like hyper or like rigid in your brain, maybe you're going to have hyper and rigid brain kids. Um, ADHD, my my friend and her husband took their kid in because they were um, trying to see if he had ADHD, and the doctor said, yes, he does, and one of you has it too. And both of them went, it's not me, it's him, it's not me, it's her right? That it is, it is inherited, right? And there's many different types of ADHD, but again, if you want to learn that, take my 205 class. So psychopathology, such as mental disorders and schizophrenia, yes, that is, there's a genetic component, right? If you have one parent with schizophrenia, which is crazy thoughts, right? It's a thought disorder. If one parent, it gives you about 25% chance. Two parents, 50, right? 50 or up. So again, but it doesn't mean that you'll have it at all. You could have a 0% chance because like you could be that one in the Punnett square who didn't get it. Okay. So look here. Uh, this one talks about like um, alcoholism and stuff. 37% of alcoholics have at least one psychiatric disorder. Now that could be depression, that could be anxiety, that could be you name it. 53% of drug users also have at least one psychiatric disorder. Again, it could be bipolar, it could be schizophrenia, it could be anything, OCD. Contributing factors to co-occurring conditions. Heredity, your genetic makeup, brain development, using substances while your brain is developing like as a teenager can get you addicted forever. Stress or trauma, right? And neurological factors, emotional or mental stability, right? So again, this is, this right here, heredity is what your genes. Brain development is environment. Stress or trauma is environment. Neurological factors, that could be both, 
right? They can be like, I have a weird brain and I'm stressed out, right? Uh, and I'm just emotional. Yeah, it's it's not easy, right? But again, we make choices in our life. And I know sometimes things are hard and we can't make the choice, but sometimes we can make a choice. Get treatment, get help, take meds. I worked in that community for a long time. So if you guys have questions on that, let me know. So that was it. That was our child. That was our chapter two. Again, we talked about our foundations here, and then we talked about conception and hereditary, and um, and all of the biological factors that come into making a human being. So I'm really excited that we got to get through chapter two. Uh, I apologize for all the technical stuff, but way to hang in there. Keep looking in um, chapter two, like at the bottom, for all those extra videos. Share if you would like, if you like them that much. But also make sure you're doing your uh, discussion board and any other assignments that needs to happen keep up with the syllabus and keep up with the hard work i will see you in the virtual world